it? Yes, now it works. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, especially that uh, a part of uh, uh, what I will present you today, uh, I actually uh, enjoy uh, my uh, research scientific activity. Uh, and then I really do enjoy uh, using actually your input into widening and making the knowledge available. So thank you very much, because uh, also for the scientist, uh, your job is incredibly uh, valuable. Um, however, um, I am also very much intact within um, a practical approach toward the uh, heritage, uh, mostly intangible cultural heritage. Intangible means something you can't really see. Uh, it seems so. Uh, it is something you cannot touch. But what's important for the intangible cultural heritage, it is it relays on its bearers. Means those people who actually remember this can repeat a language, can repeat the rituals, can repeat festivities and organize them. Uh, one of the aspects of the intangible cultural heritage is actually the folklore, means the oral traditions of nations, ethnic groups, families even. And this is what I will tell you about today. Um, I represent Museum Upper Silesian Ethnographic Park in Horzhov. Uh, and it might seem that actually our institution, which is uh, presenting uh, 18th, 19th century uh, peasantry buildings, uh, you would not really associate with digitization, isn't it? Because actually, why do we digitize things? Um, one of the reasons we actually do this is to go somewhere to see something uh, in real life. So, since I saw uh, on the online tour of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam the unicorn uh, horns, I bought a ticket, I went to Amsterdam, and I took a photo of the unicorn corns which actually uh, appeared to be some uh, naval, uh, some sea creatures' uh, horns. But to the understanding of the medieval people of Middle Ages, actually, there were unicorn corns. So this, why, this is why you digitize. Other reason to digitize is to see something you can't see normally. Um, 100 meters from here, you have the uh, museum, uh, Silesian Museum. I strongly recommend to visit. Because um, why this museum is unique, not because of its collection, to be honest, but it is unique because you go underground. Because this museum was actually created in a place of former coal mine. And why do we digitize? Uh, coal mining museum in Zabrze digitizes underground of coal mines to be shut down. Why? Because a part of the qualified employees, nobody is let down, nobody is let to go there and take photos. So a special team makes 3D scans so we can explore during the 3D, uh, 3D visits, through the tours in the underground. And what do my institution digitize? The gibberish you can see, it's in Polish. Um, and this is what we received. Our institution, uh, six years ago, received um, the whole collection of um, songs, uh, notes, 
informations, uh, analyses of folklore, Polish folklore, mostly from Upper Silesia, but not only, also from the Dombrowa Basin, which is a region here nearby. And this is what we got. Uh, lots of papers, sheets of papers you can see. It's a soured paper, that's why it gets uh, crumbly, it's very fragile. Uh, some of the texts have been transcribed. Uh, some part of the collection, they are also recordings. Real-to-real uh, -real recordings. So basically, uh, to be honest, we even uh, this is the original this is the original reel to reel recorder, but uh, it doesn't work. And we, as a museum, actually we don't uh, have one to actually listen what was given to us. The author of this collection, it's uh, a late professor of uh, ethnology, musicology. Adolf Degac, who was an un, uh, Upper Silesian researcher, collector, and uh, his family, his wife and his daughter, donated the entire the entire collection to our museum. Za kolendę dziękujemy, zdrowia, szczęścia wam życzymy, abyście tu długo żyli, a po śmierci w niebie byli. Hey, kolenda, kolenda. Okay, uh, this is what you could hear. It was a uh, very small, short sample of what we received. Uh, of course, uh, Professor de Gatch was uh, pretty famous when he was still alive. And uh, he himself published books uh, from his collections with the songs, uh, with the notes, which is also important. And we keep up this tradition. And this is, uh, this is the most recent book published uh, from based on his collection. Uh, they are the, it's a collection of uh, songs sung by the composed and sung by the Polish uprisers uh, from 1919 to 1922. And as I said, why do we digitize? Because we want more people to come, yes? Well, we had uh, quite opposite approach because we actually wanted the least people come to the institution the possible. <laughs> uh, yes, well, basically, uh, tapes, uh, the tapes are difficult to, uh, now to listen. Uh, we didn't have a device. And uh, paper uh, which we received is incredibly fragile. So, since the European Union uh, made one of the uh, major goals to digitize everything, the cultural assets, uh, also Polish government did so, followed the uh, European Union's policy. Uh, three times in a row since 1920, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, we uh, received grants from the Polish government, Minister of Culture and National Heritage, to digitize the collection of uh, Professor de Gatch. And as you can see, uh, the Silesian Digital Library, which uh, is cooperating with us, uh, makes the whole collection available. The only pity, however, is, I have to admit, that on the Polish Wikipedia, where is the article about Professor de Gatch, there is no link to the, upper, to the Silesian Digital Library. This is really a pity. <laughs> However, <laughs> yes, this is, something to be, this is something to be fixed. Yes. <laughs> so, um, as, as you can see, uh, we made for everybody available the text, the notes. However, the tapes are uh, still in the process of digitization. 
and we gave them to the best known in Polish specialists to do so, uh, the Institute of Arts of the Polish Academy of Science in Warsaw. So uh, this is in the process, and this is what we have. <laughs> So now I think you understand why we do not want people actually in our museum. <laughs> of course, in the archive, of course, only, yes. So, just a moment, okay. Um, so, um, since we made this whole collection available, it appears that actually more and more people are using it for several purposes. They are, of course, uh, scientific articles being, uh, being written and published, books. But what is most um, for me as a person enjoying the practical approach of the research and the practical results um, is the usage for popularization, but not the songs it themselves but to create new knowledge, new emotions, uh, interpersonal contacts. Will it work? Yes. Wśród se górnik po robocie i gorzołka słepie Pany chodzą w szczerym złocie a on bida klepie. Uh, może, może, can you please uh, stop? The, yes, thank you. Um, this song is, of course, one of the collect, one of the collected of Professor De Gatch. and uh, this was used to uh, to the for the purpose of the research project about rebel Silesia. Um, I think, uh, I hope many of you are familiar with a famous book by Howard Zinn, The People's History of uh, United States. Yes, it's, uh, intro It introduces the whole entire new perspective of research to give actually the voice in a history to those who usually are voiceless because the documents, the big history basically forgets about the simple people, people who work hard in the coal mines, in the steelworks, like you saw a moment ago what my colleague, my colleague was presenting. And Professor De Gatch actually collected a lot of songs which were used by Peasants, metal workers, coal miners. And thanks to this, a uh, colleague, uh, Dariusz Zalega, with his, um, he puts very interest, he gives a very interesting input uh, to the working class research recently because his input is very strongly ideolo ideologically connected uh, <laughs> with communism. Um, but he discovers um, the bottom, uh, this bottom layer of a culture. He shows us completely different experiences. And he um, created a project, Rebel Silesia, which included not only a book, articles, but also a uh, short documentary. And this song actually was a part of this documentary. Kosmowiec nagrano 30 stycznia 1968 roku. Śpiewa Czechowski Józef, urodzony w 1915 roku. Ja ci powiadam, pokochaj hutnika. Ja ci powiadam, ja ci powiadam, pokochaj hutnika. Uh, this uh, was a uh, small part, small fragment of a song of a steel worker. 
And uh, place you can see, it's actually this, the metallurgy museum of, uh, which is being led by a colleague who actually spoke a moment ago. And they used the material from the collection of Professor Degac as well. Because they reconstructed a uh, metal worker's wedding. But it was a reconstruction. People could observe. People could just enjoy uh, the professionals and amateurs singing, uh, giving the speeches, wedding speeches, for example. Um, but the people were not, not involved. And what we actually did in our museum. Um, a year ago, we actually set a band. Yes. Uh, the name uh, for Polish speakers, the association with the Polish name, the Gajonca Capella, will be clear, uh, much clearer with the name of the professor's collection. His name is Degacz. So there is this, uh, let's say, phonetical association with the author of the collection. I translated it as the bobbing band, because this is how it would seem to me more, most fitting. And um, as none of us actually is a, a schooled musician, we invited for the collaboration such one. This is Karo Przewoka. She is a musician and uh, she's an author. Uh, she actually is also a musical teacher. And she absolutely loves traditional music, traditional dance. So we invited her and she started to teach whom? people uh, had open access. Basically, we made announcements on Facebook, uh, in other media, on our website, and we invited people to actually join the bobbing band. So people came. And there were people who taught other people how to play instruments because, of course, uh, some of the members of the band have some basic knowledge and skill in playing music, but not all. Some were taught basically from the very, very basis. Also, the instruments we use, they are not instruments which you can basically find in the um, orchestras. Yes, a folk, instru folk instrument or adjusted. So, uh, there is a band, a people, happy singing. They are meeting every Thursday in our museum, in a room, and uh, practicing every Thursday afternoon. So, basically, people do it just because they want. They have such a need, they have such a desire. Uh, of course, you may ask why, but in my opinion, um, it basically connects with this, um, let's say, um, peasant approach, peasant turn in our uh, recent culture, yes. The, for example, what we can observe already for uh, three, four years in Upper Silesia is the folk costumes revival. Yes, something which was forgotten, unwanted, hidden in uh, wardrobes of the grandmothers. Now is basically taken out and basically people rejoice wearing the folk costumes. Uh, but what people also do like to do, it appeared, it's being together, 
singing, celebrating. Even uh, events and celebrations and feasts, which actually are long forgotten, which actually my ethnologists might say that they belong to the 19th century culture. Yes. So um, we have here a Christmas celebration in our museum. So here you can see in the background uh, the roof yes, of the 19th century, 19th century uh, hut. And here you can see the members of our digging, digging band, bobbing band, actually. Uh, so we might say that people, uh, that we use actually people because we make events, we invite people, uh, people have to pay. Uh, it is not so because, of course, the entry to the museum costs money. However, we observe uh, one event after other event that the group of people coming and joining the bobbing band is actually growing. So, we decided to uh, prepare for them singing books. This is one from the, uh, from the event Dancing and Singing in the Village. Uh, which uh, was uh, 12th of May, I think, this year. And uh, everybody got, uh, got a singing book. We also prepared a singing books for blind people with a bra braille language. So they also could join this festivity. And as you can see, uh, we also had younger participants. And um, if we talk about intangible cultural heritage, this is one of the most important factors. Uh, because just being together, just, sim just basically simply rejoicing uh, good company, Good weather, nice place, plenty of where's plenty of green, yes. But if we would not digitize the materials, they would not, they would never reach such a bright audience. They would not reach the young people. And intangible cultural heritage is alive only if the next following generations take it and accept it as their heritage. Heritageization is one of the, <laughs> I would say, the bigger impact of what we actually did. That songs which were sung by our ancestors, grandparents, great-grandparents, who worked underground in the heat of big furnaces. And now, there is almost no industry in Upper Silesia. And there will be no more in the following 15, 20 years. But since young people have access to this, they can still sing it and treat it as their heritage. And the heritage, you know, it is not everything which was left from the past. No. These are monuments, artifacts. This is what is left from the past. Heritage is something what builds our identity, what we choose from the past to be a part of us, who we are. Thank you 
very much. It's the first time in my life I actually fit it in time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Wait. Thank you. Uh, I was at the museum yesterday. It was very nice. Oh, thank and, you. <laughs> um, I was also thinking: uh, Do you uh, is there a link between the museum and Wikidata uh, already established today? I, I don't think so. Opportunities there. The, yes, I think there are open opportunities. Yes, nice. <laughs> and they are very welcome. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I will connect with you because I, okay, I would well, like it to. would be very desirable. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Let me just go and check online. Oh, you're getting lots of thanks online, by the way. Okay, thank you very much <laughs> once again. I did. Okay, actually, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to be slightly sneaky and drop in with a question. Um, in terms of the recordings from sort of 1919 to 1920s, do you know who w is on those recordings? Do you have the names of the people? Because I was just thinking that it's incredibly beautiful that their voices are still with us on those recordings, subject to a, a rogue magnet going near it. Um, but do we know who those people are or were? Um, most of the recordings are indeed, um, have indeed the authorship, yes. Because Professor Degaj was incredibly detailed with his research, so actually yes. Uh, however, um, finding whom these people actually were it's still it's still ongoing process yes uh, we actually this year with the end of this year we finished the third stage of the digitization yes so it is still ongoing and uh, then when it will be fully accessible we of course invite researchers uh, to also use the materials and make their own discoveries, yes. We are also a small team and it's, you know, uh, we can't do everything. However, this was actually one of the reasons we, we want to make it accessible. You'll be glad to know um, someone in the chat has actually said that those links have now been added. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Any more questions in the room? Oh, you've now also got a web page about him as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, is, is there a, a web page in a Wikipedia ma page in the making? Because the, I've seen the web page in Polish and there's yes. also Russian, but, but no other language. No other uh, languages, versions. yes. And this is actually, uh, this is something to be uh, fixed. I, 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 would, <laughs> I would care for a German version, actually, because uh, there are some links ne, to, to German language as well here. And yes. that's also maybe one follow-up question. Are there I know in the past there have been projects, um, coal mining, history of coal mining uh, from uh, rural, rural area, Ruhrgebiet in Germany and Katowice. Um, do you know something about these parallel projects? I have a book about this, but uh, it's, it's in my hotel. It's from 2000. Three, I think <laughs> there was a big conference. Do you know something about this? Uh, about the projects about coal mining? Yeah, it's about the history of coal mining. In in uh, they have a heritage park in in uh, in in the rural area as well. Um, and maybe there are connections. Uh, um. Um, okay. Um, then I will have to uh, explain myself a little bit. I. Um, I work now in the Museum Ethnographic Park in Horsov. However, uh, two years ago yet, I worked uh, in the coal mining museum in Zabrze. And um, I was one of the persons who actually stayed in uh, contact with the colleagues from uh, both uh, Deutsches Bergbau Museum and uh, Zollverein. Uh, and yes, we planned... Uh, some activities we had even support from uh, the local government of Nordrhein-Westfalen. Uh, 
Um, however, for reason unknown to me, um, this activity was unfortunately, sadly, stopped for now. So also now the uh, the head of the Deutsches Bergbau Museum had changed, and I think they have also different priorities at this mm -hmm. moment. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap it up there so that everyone can get away for lunch. Uh, lunch is down in the main hall, in case you're wondering where it is. Okay, thank you very much for coming, everyone. <laughs>